Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we are going to look at some of the many factors that can challenge the authority that states have. So tonight, we'll look at challenges to sovereignty. We start by continuing our conversation on devolution. Again, devolution is the transfer of certain powers from the state central government to separate political subdivisions within the state's territory. This can produce several different outcomes. This may lead countries to designate areas as autonomous, meaning that they largely operate on their own. Russia has several autonomous areas to accommodate its ethnically diverse population. Native American reservations are semi-autonomous within the United States because they're free from the control of the subnational units, but must still adhere to the U.S. national government. Nunavut is another example of an autonomous region, this time in Canada. But other times, countries may transfer some authority to subnational units without granting complete autonomy. Canada has done this with its French-Canadian population by recognizing French as one of its two official languages for the entire country. Belgium is also divided linguistically. The north of Belgium, which borders the Netherlands, speaks a variant of Dutch, while the south, bordering France, speaks French. Belgium tried to address this by transitioning from a unitary system of government to a federal system. It then later created independent administrations, so each region could control their own economic, educational, and cultural decisions, while also establishing the country's capital, Brussels, as legally bilingual. Nigeria has a lot of cultural diversity as well. There are three dominant cultural regions that are ethnically, linguistically, and religiously diverse. The country created a federal system and actually weathered a civil war to allow the individual regions and the subnational states to make their own decisions. Spain has also done this with Catalonia. Catalans make up about 15% of Spain's population, while residing on less than 10% of its land. But they produce about 35% of all Spanish exports and over 50% of its high-tech exports. So Spain doesn't want to see Catalonia leave. So they've devolved more authority to the government of Catalonia in hopes of quieting its independence movement. Catalonia handles its own police force, education, health care, immigration, taxation, and transportation. Even still, there are those in Catalonia who are still pushing for independence from Spain. And when a state breaks down through conflicts among its ethnicities, it's known as balkanization. So while Spain and our other examples have avoided balkanization so far, They've given up sovereignty at the national level to do it. Our next series of examples have disintegrated, often due to conflict and colonization, meaning that former states lost sovereignty as new states and people gained it. Eritrea is religiously, ethnically, and linguistically diverse, as several of our other examples have been. They initially declared their independence from the European colonizer, Italy, in 1941. But then Ethiopia seized Eritrea as a province. This then led to decades of conflict before Eritreans gained independence in 1993. Even still, another 20 years of conflict ensued, and it's only been recently that Eritrea and Ethiopia have reopened trade and diplomatic relationships but Eritrea still struggles with their own autocratic government and poor human rights record. South Sudan gained their independence from Sudan in 2011. 
After the British colonized and superimposed boundaries, the former Sudan was ethnically and religiously diverse. A civil war was fought for over two decades before a referendum on independence was held and South Sudan gained their independence. East Timor was a Portuguese colony until 1975, at which point Indonesian troops invaded. It wasn't until 1999 that the majority of East Timor's population voted for full independence. And even still, there was violence from terrorist groups that sought to remain part of Indonesia. But by 2002, East Timor, or Timor-Leste, has gained its sovereignty and independence. The Soviet Union was a global superpower during the Cold War. Its huge size was a challenge, but other problems escalated especially during the 1980s. A failing economy, weakened military, and ethnic separatism from more than a hundred different groups, combined with unpopular social and political reforms, drove its republics to seek their own sovereignty. By 1991, one by one, the Soviet republics declared their independence and the Soviet Union dissolved. So devolution remains a challenge to state sovereignty because territories may gain decision-making authority, become autonomous, or disintegrate altogether. Space-time compression has made the world functionally smaller. The internet is, to a degree, eroding political boundaries by allowing information and ideas to diffuse more rapidly and completely. This, in turn, is presenting a challenge to state sovereignty. How governments attempt to control or influence their citizens' use of the internet varies around the world. China has allowed its citizens to access the internet, but has controlled what information they can view. This has been called the Great Firewall of China. China has created its own internet search engines and social media platforms, such as TikTok, which have diffused globally. This has allowed the Chinese government to self-regulate the information on the internet for its citizens and have limited, though not completely eliminated, devolutionary protests. The most notable recent example were the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong which China effectively silenced in 2021. But there are other examples of countries using the internet and social media to strengthen their authority. Germany does not allow the promotion of Nazi ideology, and Twitter complied with those laws in silencing neo-Nazi groups within the country. The Taliban in Afghanistan, a political and military organization that enforces strict adherence to Islamic ideals, once banned the internet because it doesn't align with Islamic practices. They changed their stance, however, when they realized that they could use the internet and social media to promote their ethnic identity, spread their message, and recruit new members. And while Afghanistan has poor infrastructure, almost 70% of its people have cell phone access and more than 4 million people are estimated to be using social media apps. Many governments are realizing that social media and the internet can be used to consolidate their power internally while pursuing cyber warfare externally. And that then leads to our final and perhaps best modern example of the role of technology in devolution and the challenge to state sovereignty, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was a series of pro-democracy protests across several predominantly Muslim and Arab states in Southwest Asia and North Africa. It began in Tunisia in 2010. And Arab states tried to limit these protests. Egypt, Libya, and Syria severed their country's internet connection completely while the governments of Tunisia and Saudi Arabia used internet censorship. That was because the internet played a pivotal role in many of these protests. For example, in Tunisia and Egypt, 
Activists used Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to garner support and organize demonstrations. And Tunisia is probably the greatest success story as they held their first democratic elections in October of 2011. But the Arab Spring protests in Syria are the events that ultimately led to the violent civil war that even still is ongoing. So there are various outcomes from advancements in technology that can consolidate or challenge state sovereignty. Shifting gears, the remainder of our conversation tonight will focus on when countries work together to accomplish a shared objective or gain some kind of benefit from collaboration. This is known as supranationalism, or a term applied to the association created by three or more states for their mutual benefit and achievement of shared objectives. The European Union is an example of a supranational organization. So supranational organizations are international political units comprised of sovereign states. And there are more than 60 major supranational organizations, most of which have come into existence during the second half of the 20th century. Countries are increasingly willing to participate in these organizations to accomplish a range of goals that could be economic, political, environmental, or cultural in nature. The Arctic Council, founded in 1996, promotes cooperation among the eight countries with territory in the Arctic, as well as with six organizations that represent Arctic indigenous communities. They do extensive scientific research related to sustainable development, climate change, and environmental protection. Other countries have joined a supranational organization to create economies of scale. So before we provide some details, let's understand what economies of scale are. They are cost advantages that come with a larger scale of operations. Economies of scale will be a topic in several of our later units, but effectively, when a company or country produces a lot of something, the cost to produce each item becomes cheaper. So essentially, countries may join a supranational organization so they can pool their resources and labor forces, reducing costs so that each country in turn can benefit. For example, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN or ASEAN, joined together in 1967 to advance economic growth through trade in the region, among other social and political goals. In 2015, though, they created the ASEAN Economic Community, or AEC, to create a single market and production base. Collectively, the AEC represents the seventh largest economy in the world and the third largest in Asia, and it's growing considerably larger. They can produce tremendous amounts of goods, benefiting from the economies of scale generated from the whole organization. So individual countries benefit from cheaper resources or labor, allowing them to be more competitive in the global economy. This improves the economic growth for each member state and for the organization as a whole. Other organizations form to promote greater trade within the supranational organization. The North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, did this in the 1990s. NAFTA was updated in 2020 as the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA. The USMCA is a regional trading block that eliminated barriers to trade. Tariffs, or taxes on imports, were removed to promote the free flow of goods and services across the borders of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. This led to greater trade between the countries and general economic benefits for each country, though, to be clear, not necessarily for every citizen 
in each country. The last goal that supranationalism can accomplish is greater military presence. NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is the world's largest military alliance. It consists of many countries of Europe, as well as the United States and Canada. The combined forces of the member states of NATO carry much more military might than the individual countries. And part of the agreement is that an attack against one ally is considered an attack against all allies. Though that article has only been invoked once following the terrorist attacks against the United States on September 11, 2001. Essentially, countries join supranational organizations because they see an advantage in working with other member states or they want to avoid the disadvantages of not joining such an organization. But there is a cost which is associated with membership. Oftentimes, countries will have to relinquish a degree of their sovereignty, give up a portion of their own decision-making authority for the greater benefits that the alliance may provide. Let's examine a few more examples and discuss the challenge to sovereignty that supranational organizations can present. The United Nations is the world's preeminent supranational organization that promotes peace and security throughout the world. It was established in 1945 and currently has 193 member states, representing basically every sovereign state in the world. The UN's focus is on maintaining peace, developing friendly relations, achieving cooperation, protecting human rights, and solving international problems. The UN has a Security Council comprised of 15 members, including five permanent members, the US, the UK, France, Russia, and China. The Security Council can impose sanctions and authorize the use of force to maintain or restore peace and all member states are obligated to comply with decisions made by the Security Council. And right there is where the challenge of sovereignty presents itself. Sovereign states are supposed to be the final authority on matters regarding their country. But when a state joins a supranational organization, they may relinquish some sovereignty. When the Security Council rules, members must abide by that ruling, at least in theory. Perhaps the most prominent example of states giving up a great deal of sovereignty to be part of a supranational organization is the European Union. Several smaller organizations eventually coalesced in 1993 into the European Union. Since then, nearly 30 countries have joined together with the main mission being economic integration throughout Europe. But the EU also has standardized social, cultural, and political policies for its members. Members ensure tolerance of religious and ethnic differences, human rights, and gender equality. So while the EU began as and remains a trading bloc that has removed tariffs so goods can move freely, it has taken things considerably farther. People can move and work freely throughout any member state, meaning most of the continent is effectively borderless for people, goods, services, and capital. This has created a single market across much of Europe. Many of the countries have also joined the unified monetary system, utilizing the euro as their currency. Effectively, the goal of the European Union was to bind together the continent so tightly that conflicts like the two world wars wouldn't happen again. Combine that with creating economies of scale to rival China and the United States. But the point of this lecture is how these concepts challenge state sovereignty. And EU members lose considerable sovereignty, so they don't get to make all the decisions they may want, like controlling who and what comes across their borders. They may also be drawn in to help struggling members, 
such as when Greece went into debt and had to be bailed out. If countries want to remain members of a powerful and prosperous organization, they have little choice in these matters. But in 2020, the United Kingdom withdrew from the EU over many of these same concerns. Despite these challenges, Africa is pursuing a pan-continental organization in much the same way the EU has developed. The African Union evolved into an organization that is promoting unity and solidarity among African countries. The primary focus is again economic development, but with a key goal being to create a visa-free Africa, similar to the open borders of the European Union. So to wrap up tonight, I want to reiterate a key takeaway. Supranational organizations provide significant benefits, which is why more countries continue to join them. However, a certain degree of sovereignty is relinquished to the organization. Member states of the Arctic Council give up some sovereignty to help address regional environmental concerns. ASEAN countries might lose jobs to cheaper workers from other member states. And NATO countries might be forced to fight a conflict if one of their allies is attacked. So the benefits and drawbacks can vary by circumstance and scale. Supranational organizations can help bring people together while also dividing others, which is a topic we'll explore next time. Thank you for your attention tonight. Have a good evening, everyone.